this week on Choice Hacking. Jo Malone, a popular British perfume brand, also the name of its founder, wanted to crack the lucrative U.S. market. These days, Jo Malone is a part of the $52 billion beauty conglomerate Estee Lauder. But when it first tried to expand into the U.S., it was a cult brand, to put it politely, and they had the marketing budget to match. Zero. But Jo Malone managed to turn that true $0 marketing budget into an asset that catapulted the brand into the world's most exclusive department stores, like Bergdorf's in New York and Harrods in London. And that growth didn't happen by accident. It was down to deeply understanding customers and using behavioral science and psychology, consciously or not, to get people buying. I'm Jennifer Kleinhens, and you're listening to Choice Hacking a podcast about applying behavioral science and psychology to business, marketing, experience design, and more. Join me today as we unpack the psychology behind how Jo Malone conquered America and how you can apply lessons from her business to improve your own. But before we get started, I want to take a minute to chat about Choice Hacking's new coaching practice. Did you know that Choice Hacking isn't just a podcast? We also offer courses, workshops, training, consulting, and new to Choice Hacking, I'm now offering one-on-one coaching with me, Jen Kleinhens. Currently, I'm offering three types of coaching, executive coaching, business and marketing coaching, as well as a group business coaching program for freelancers and solopreneurs. Stay tuned for updates about that last one. This type of coaching isn't for people looking for fluffy HR nonsense or life coaching, whatever that is. This is an experienced professional and certified coach working with you to create actionable, tangible solutions to your biggest leadership, business, and marketing challenges. If you're looking for an objective sounding board and professional advice, give me a shout. And just a heads up, my maximum capacity for coaching is just three clients. That's right, only three. Sound interesting? Well, just visit choicehacking.com forward slash coaching to learn more. That's choicehacking.com forward slash coaching. Now on to the show. Jo Malone had a tiny perfume company in England, but she managed to persuade luxury retailer Bergdorf Goodman to host a pop-up shop for her brand in New York City. But Jo had no way to get people into the store. She was an unknown brand in a new, notoriously tough market in the 1990s when social media wasn't really a thing. She was trying to get people to take time out of their busy day to spend a decent chunk of change on a luxury item. But she knew if Bergdorf's didn't see sales, Jo and her brand would never be invited back. And she'd have to give up on her dream of expanding her brand in the U.S. All she brought with her from London were a thousand bags to hold customer purchases, a bit of product to sell in the pop-up, and some hope. Malone told The Guardian, I sat there in a hotel room thinking, I am going to fail. What am I going to do? But then Jo had a brilliant idea. After breaking down in her hotel room, Jo Malone pulled herself together and created a clever plan. A plan so cunning you could put a tail on it and call it a weasel. She called some friends and friends of friends in London and begged them for the phone numbers of anyone that they knew in New York City. Malone ended up finding 50 people and asked them to walk around the most fashionable parts of New York City carrying the distinctive black and cream color Joe Malone bag. Joe explained, These bags started to be recognized in really savvy parts of New York City. So when we opened the store, people thought there was already a store somewhere. There wasn't. Malone had a successful New York launch and only a few years later sold the business to beauty giant Estee Lauder for an undisclosed amount of cash estimated to be in the tens of millions. All because of the power of a psychological principle known as behavioral residue. Behavioral residue describes the physical traces in action a product or a behavior leaves in its wake. Basically, the easier it is to spot and notice something, the more likely it is to catch on. As Jonah Berger, marketing professor and author of the book Contagious, put it, it's why shirts tend to be trendsetting and not socks. Because you see and notice and admire shirts, but you don't really notice most people's socks. 
So it follows that if you want to make a product more popular, you need to make it more visible. When Apple launched the original iPod in 2001, the most popular portable headphones came with the Sony Walkman. They were black foam and metal headphones that went around the top of people's heads. And pretty much everyone was wearing the same or a similar set of headphones when the iPod launched. But Steve Jobs insisted that the iPod ship not with ugly metal and foam headphones, but with white earbuds. These earbuds weren't just a nice piece of kit. They became a cultural phenomenon. They really stood out, and they told the world that you were cool and innovative and also probably pretty well off. The earbuds also featured heavily in the iconic iPod TV ads, where dancers shown only in silhouette shimmied around the screen to songs like Jet's Are You Gonna Be My Girl. So one, two, three, take my hand and come with me because you look so fine that I really want to make you mine. The only thing that wasn't in silhouette were the dancers' white earbuds, which shook and vibrated along with the song. Pretty soon the iPod became a status symbol and a personal statement, all because of the power of behavioral residue. When legendary shoe designer Christian Louboutin started his company, he only sold 200 pairs of shoes in his first year. Better than nothing, but hardly enough to become a household name. Louboutin knew for his company to survive, he'd need to find a way for his products to stand out and catch on. While working in his design studio trying to crack a way to make his shoes go viral, his assistant's red Chanel nail polish caught his eye. In a moment of brilliance, Louboutin grabbed the bottle of nail polish and began painting the sole of a prototype heel. Suddenly, the shoe stood out, not only in the store, but on the street, catching the attention of passersby. Louboutin's red soles eventually became an iconic symbol of passion, sex, love, and of course, the Louboutin brand. Louboutin stilettos soon became a favorite of celebrities like Kate Moss and Oprah, and were even named the most desirable shoes in the world. His biggest single client is American novelist Danielle Steele, who owns over 6,000 pairs of Louboutins. At an average cost of about $900 a pair, that's $5.4 million worth of one brand of shoes. The red soles were such a stroke of genius and such a boost to the Louboutin brand that inevitably there were copycats. But Christian Louboutin, in a situation pretty unique in the fashion industry, which is known for its lax copyright enforcement, has won many copyright infringement cases where other brands have copied his famous red-soled style. In 1999, Starbucks first Red Cup launched as a seasonal marketing campaign. They came back every year with a slight twist to the plain red cup design, and as Starbucks rapidly expanded all over the U.S., so did red cup season. Pretty quickly, Starbucks red cups became a cultural signal that the holiday season had officially started. They were such a cultural icon that in 2015, the red cups became a flashpoint in the culture wars. Andrea Williams of the U.K.'s Christian Concern claimed that the simple plain red cup's design with its snowflakes and trees were part of the so-called War on Christmas, apparently because snowflakes and trees weren't Christmassy enough. Getting your first red cup at Christmas isn't just about a new way to drink Starbucks. It gives people a bit of FOMO until they've gotten their first red cup, and it makes them proud to show it off to their friends on social media when they do finally get theirs. By 2014, an image of Starbucks red cup was shared every 14 seconds on social media. These examples are all fine and dandy, you might be saying. But how does behavioral residue work in the digital realm? When people don't really see you out and about browsing TikTok, for example. Creating behavioral residue for digital products can be challenging, but it's not impossible. One of the original free email services, Hotmail, used to include the line, 
Get your free email at Hotmail at the very end of every email. That simple line helped them attract 12 million users in less than two years with a total marketing budget of only $500,000. Steve Jobs and Apple were inspired, you could say, by Hotmail when the iPhone first launched. When it debuted, the iPhone was considered a major status symbol. That's why the line, sent from my iPhone, added automatically to the end of every email, was so genius. You started to see who in your social or work circle had an iPhone. It kept the product top of mind, and you started to want one, too. If you want to market your products like Joe Malone, Apple, Louboutin, and Starbucks, here's how you can leverage the power of behavioral residue. Start by asking yourself, how can we create physical or digital evidence that people are using our product? How can an element of our product, like the red sole of Louboutins, stand out? Is there a way to make it easier for customers to share our brand? For example, Apple includes a sticker of its logo with every sale. Ferrari's biggest revenue generator is its merchandise. And the I Voted stickers given out at election time help create positive social pressure to get others to vote. Thank you for listening to the Choice Hacking Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it on social media. It takes me 20 plus hours to put together every episode, and it is a huge help when you share an episode with your LinkedIn, Twitter, threads, or even your TikTok followers. And don't forget, you can learn more about behavioral science and psychology applied to business when you subscribe to the free Choice Hacking email list. You'll join more than 8,000 brilliant marketers and entrepreneurs from companies like Google, Coke, and Disney who get my newsletter. To sign up, just visit choicehackingideas.com. That's choicehackingideas.com. Until next time. I hit record it, Jap, you can't ignore it. I'm transforming now these cars and planes, I'm always boarding. Just out touring down in Charlotte like I play for.